Hello, and welcome back to Data-Driven Methods in Dynamical Systems. So, uh, today I want to talk to you about the wagon wheel effect, Nyquist frequencies, and aliasing. If you look at some older westerns, back when cameras didn't really record at a very high frame rate, what you'll see is something that we call aliasing, and that can be perceived when you look at a wagon wheel. Basically, a wagon wheel effect is when a cart is moving forward, but the wheels look like they're going backwards. And this happens because the video itself was undersampled. So there's a ton of videos on YouTube uh, that go over the wagon wheel effect, and they actually produce the effect themselves uh, through, you know, spinning wheels and, and just as you would expect. But very few of them actually give you any footage that supposedly was a source of this wagon wheel effect. And so I went digging, and I went to see if I can find anything uh, that actually resembled a wagon wheel effect in a Western. And where I started was the movie Wagon Wheels. I mean, where else would you start? It was a 1935-1934 movie, uh, black and white, obviously. And uh, as best as I can see, it's just a movie about people hanging out with wagon wheels. The wagon wheels were most of the time just standing still and people were moving around them, leaning on them, crawling underneath them. It was a prop for the movie, but they didn't actually move much. And when they actually did move, they moved rather slowly so that the cameras at the time handled the video effect just fine. It makes sense that you wouldn't want a wagon moving horribly fast, especially when it's attached to a poor horse. I mean, that's a lot of momentum for the horse to stop. And so, yeah, it just sort of made sense that it would be harder to find than I thought. So I kept digging and I found another movie called The Wildest Wagons of the West. Nice alliteration uh, and sort of a goofy movie. There was one hope in there, and it is when they were actually repairing one of their wagon wheels, and they had removed the axle and the wagon wheels from the wagon itself. That meant there was no horse to hurt, and it did start going really fast in the movie. Unfortunately, it was only one tenth of a second where you can actually see the wagon wheel effect, and so that wasn't really that inspiring. The wagon wheels and the axle actually went rather fast, but in all those shots, it was a wide shot, so you couldn't actually see the spokes of the wheel. So I kept looking, and I sort of gave up on wagon wheels, and I thought maybe a train from an old western movie would work out, and so I went and looked at The Red Sun. The Red Sun had a few shots of a train, but it didn't really have any good close-ups of the wheels uh, when they were moving very fast. So that was sort of a bust. And then I finally found uh, what I was looking for, and this was in the movie Wagon Train. At around 25 minutes and 55 seconds, approximately, uh, you can actually see the wagon wheel effect. And this is a wagon that is moving right in front of the camera and you see it going backwards. And so after about an hour of searching, much longer than I thought it would take to find this wagon wheel effect, I found it. It's funny how difficult it was to find given the name of the effect, but you know, there you are. All right, so where does this end up coming from? Why do we see these wagon wheels going backwards? And this is an effect called undersampling. When you end up actually undersampling a signal, what ends up happening is that you can actually fit multiple truncated Fourier series of up to that sampling frequency that you did to match up with the video and interpolate the points that you're seeing. Uh, and our brains kind of do that for us as well. It tells us that, hey, this wagon looks like it's going backwards. Now you might think that the wagon wheel effect is actually just something that happens to cameras, but it actually happens in your brain. In a paper from 1996, I uh, called The Wagon Wheel Illusion in Movies and Reality. Um, the author, Joseph Paydarfar, um, he was from the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Uh, he basically published a paper where they were able to actually induce a wagon wheel effect in humans uh, using our visual systems, not only using strobing lights to simulate, say, a camera shutter, uh, but actually also in continuous light. And so they use this as evidence that human vision is processed as a sequence of visual episodes. So how does it work mathematically? How do we go ahead and produce this using notions that we've already established about periodic functions and their Fourier transforms? So what we can do is we can talk about the Nyquist theorem. And basically what the Nyquist theorem says is that if you have a band limited function, and that means that if you take the Fourier transform of a periodic function and the Fourier transform itself ends up being compactly supported, which means a zero outside of some finite region, then as long as you sample at at least twice that frequency, you can produce the original signal back. Exactly. 
This is something we can actually show with what we just did in the last lecture, where we took the Fourier transform of a periodic function and we showed that it was a series of impulses. Now, basically what was attached to each one of those impulses was a, the evaluation of the Fourier transform of our periodic function at a very particular point. So the idea is that after a certain point, that Fourier transform is gonna be zero. And then that means that the phi infinite series that we were looking at before is actually a finite sum of impulses. And if we take the inverse Fourier transform of that, is you get a Fourier series that has only a finite number of terms. And it ranges from say negative n up to n, where we go through the frequencies of n over t. And so if we go back to our discrete Fourier transform picture of being a matrix equation, what we see is that if we're sampling within a single period, we need to have at least one over two n plus one samples in order to get a full rank matrix. That means we need to sample at at least twice the maximum frequency of our signal in order to reproduce it exactly by making this a full rank matrix and a full rank linear system. Now, if we sample more frequently than that, that's great. That just means that we have a very tall matrix and we saw before we can use a pseudo inverse in order to find the inverse of that. Now, if you want a more formal derivation of this fact, uh, I'll put a link at the very end of the video where I'll dive into a, a much more theoretical discussion of this, but this video I'm just gonna keep down to examples and sort of a high level intuition of what this Nyquist frequency is. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna break off and uh, well, I guess, show you one of my watches again. These are really great examples of things that move through time and you know exactly what frequency things change on a watch. We know that the watch hand makes a full revolution once every minute. And so that'll give us a sort of benchmark as far as figuring out exactly the frequency of which we need to be sampling in order to make the watch look like it's moving forwards versus moving backwards. And then we'll jump into MATLAB and see if we can like adjust the sampling rates of the resultant video that I get and generate this wagon wheel effect ourselves. Hey, so right now I'm sitting here at my computer running some MATLAB and I have a video uh, that's really just a long exposure shot of my watch. Uh, it was taken overnight uh, and I made this for my uh, Queen's Gambit video, the second part, uh, which isn't out yet, but uh, you know, stay tuned and it'll be here. So what I'm going to do is this, so this time lapse was made at one every 10 seconds. Uh, and, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and manipulate uh, our samples of that in order to see uh, time moving forwards or backwards, uh, according to the seconds. But, we're, but we'll be able to see the whole time, the minute hand is always going to be moving forward. And so this is going to be the wagon wheel effect all seen on a single watch. And, um, yeah, so why don't we go ahead and take a look. I've already loaded up in MATLAB. Uh, it's a really simple series of commands, um, but I went ahead and put them together for you so I can just push play. I commented out on some of the initial commands because that's just loading the movie and it's going to make everything choke and, and slow down a bit, but just uncomment them and, uh, and it'll work fine for you. So I have this as an MP4 file uh, that I'm reading in through MATLAB and MATLAB's very good about reading all these things. And it gives us an array uh, that we can pull from uh, frame by frame and put and show through image read. And then I slow image read down a little bit by using the pause feature to make sure that we can see each one of the frames rather than having them all run as fast as they can. So let's go ahead and take a look. So I'll go ahead and get the screen recording going. So here we go. Uh, this is what we got. So we, uh, so this is all the stuff you'd have to un comment if you're doing this the first time. So video reader will read in uh, wagon watches uh, 2.mp4 and, and it puts into this uh, here, this M. So this is an object that you end up getting. And so this is a kind of uh, thing that stores not just uh, straight, like um, not straight data, but also other features of the data. And so it ends up being kind of a f like a four dimensional array. In any case, uh, you can dump that four-dimensional array into a proper matrix, and that's going to be this all frames, and so this is a four-dimensional matrix, and uh, and this is just tells us about about that. So if I run this command here, this tells me that it is a 1080 by 1920 by three, so that is uh, our height by our width, and uh, and that's three color channels, and this is how many frames, uh, 1300. 
So I so I'm going to comment these out because I don't want to run them again because that'll make everything take a long time. And so now I'm going to I design uh, the frames per second that I'm taking. And so I the video itself samples at frames per se at one tenth frames per second. And so if I want to convert that to something I can use, it, we're going to have basically one tenth divided by the frames per second. And and then I go ahead and spool that in here, and this is just a for loop. I, I floor some things to make sure I don't get fractional values. And then other than that, I just do the image show of the particular frame I'm looking for. I want all three color channels, and I want the full width and height, and I want this specific frame. And so that's what it's gonna give me. And I tell it to pause for 1 20th of a second, and then shows me the next one. Uh, and so this is at 1 15, but let's go ahead and see what happens when we uh, sample it. Uh, one tenth frames per second. So that's the full video. So this is what we get. We see specifically jumps between uh, every two indices, and so that's exactly one tenth, uh, one tenth sampling rate. And uh, and it looks like it's moving forward. Uh, we see the mid hand moving forward, uh, and this moves forward uh, once a minute, and this moves forward uh, I think once an hour. And uh, and yeah, that's a. Uh, I mean that's that's a chronograph. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop this. I'm going to use command period. And now let's go ahead and take a look at what happens when I do, say, 1 uh, 20th frames per second. So we're going to see a larger jump. Uh, so we go from 1 to 5, 1 to 5. And so basically, 1 20th frames per second means that you have three samples per minute. So uh, we're saying three samples per minute, and that's making a nice little triangle here. So that's pretty nice. Stop that. Uh, let's change it to 1 30th. And so this is like two frames per minute, and so I should see uh, just like a straight back and forth here. Uh, this should have stopped, there we go. So let's go ahead and see what we get. Boom, 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 there we go. Uh, we see the time still moving forward, but we're just jumping back and forth between these two indices because it's only two frames per, per minute. All right, now let's go ahead and see what happens when we decrease it even further. 1 60th, we should never see the, the second hand move at all. And so what do we got? Yep, second hand stays still, and everything else just keeps moving forward with the minutes. Now, if I want, I can go ahead and say, uh, take a look at 1 90th. What ends up happening? Again, same sort of thing. This is one sample every one and a half minutes. And so, uh, so yeah, so we still get that sort of jumping back and forth, except the minute hand's moving a lot faster. But now let's take it to something interesting. So 110, one out of 110. And so this isn't exactly an integer. Uh, Ultimate, but there we go. We start seeing the wagon wheel effect at play. Uh, we're still skipping uh, Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we see the minute hands moving forward uh, the second hands moving backwards and uh, And yeah, that's exactly a wagon wheel effect We can maybe get a little bit more dramatic if we get closer to 120 and so I'll say 1 every 115 and there it looks nice and smooth but backwards and that's the wagon wheel effect for you. So if you decrease your sampling rate enough, you can actually create an aliasing effect where it's actually going to be, make look, something look like it's going backwards. Uh, this is sort of a backwards clock effect rather than a wagon wheel, but uh, strangely enough, I don't have any wagons available. Um, and okay, yeah, I didn't really want to start my car for this. So that is the wagon wheel effect uh, applied to my watches. Uh, so that that really is the essence of aliasing and you saw some graphs that, during the lecture that showed you what aliasing was you know for regular sinusoids and really it's just a matter of this uh, indeterminacy in the discrete Fourier transform matrix when you don't actually have enough samples and so I guess I'll just go ahead and leave you here with this and uh, and thank you for watching if you want more content and you want to learn more about the Fourier transform uh, please you know, subscribe and come back. And, uh, and yeah, we'll have more on the Fourier transform. This next week's gonna be all about approximations, polynomial approximations, spline approximations, a little bit of crigging. And, uh, and yeah, that'll be a lot of fun to go through. In any case, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.